Amen. The day of the Lord. Are you ready? Amen. Amen. Ezekiel chapter 30. Ezekiel chapter 30. The day of the Lord cometh. I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready. Amen. Uh, by the way, I'm already collecting some uh, questions uh, later on this afternoon. Uh, if you write some questions down, get them to me. If you want to just lay them up here, that's fine. And uh, I'll look at them and I will tell you what I think the Bible says. Amen? Amen. When the Lord appears, He's going to appear in the clouds. That's what the Bible says, okay? And uh, something that I had been studying, you know, over the years associated with the day of the Lord, okay? You can, you can just sort of see the day of the Lord as everything that God said He's going to do, He's going to do it. He's going to do it on that day. When Jesus said, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. The first time he came was the day of the Lord, okay? But the perfect fulfillment of everything that God said is going to be the day of the Lord, okay? And on that day, those of you who have decided that you're going to believe what God said, you're going to believe what God said over what anybody else in the world said. It doesn't matter if it came from a from a laboratory, it doesn't matter if it came from a university, and it doesn't even matter if it came from a pulpit. You decided that you were going to believe what God said versus what man said. And I think all of us agree that when it comes to trying to relate to people who God is, what God is, what He does, how He does it, and His nature and His character and everything like that, there's so many things in the Bible, and there's no doubt that as we convey it, we get it wrong in one place or another. So in all the years that I have been uh, preaching to people, that I have been talking about Bible prophecy and the coming of the Lord, um, God's just laid into my heart to always be careful to never put it out that I think I know everything. Okay? Oh, I wouldn't mind knowing everything. Amen? And I think the reason why I think we're all here is what we want to know. We want to know something. And that sets you apart from the people who are very, very comfortable with ignorance. Not only comfortable, they're pretty good at it. Okay? But, but God's people want to know. Okay? We just, and we don't care what it is as long as we know that it came from the Lord. Amen? So, studying the day of the Lord, that time when Christ is going to appear and He's going to set forth everything that He's going to do, I, I began to notice things that the Bible was saying about that day, that it was associated with several things. And we kind of went over that this morning. But one of the, the particular things that I think is most associated with the day of the Lord, especially His appearing, is that it's associated with clouds, the symbolism of clouds in the Bible. And what does it mean? So in Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 1, uh, God tells Ezekiel, the son of man, he says, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say. By the way, there's your definition of prophesying. Okay? Can a woman, here we go, can a woman prophesy? Absolutely. Absolutely, ladies. Okay? You got a mouth. That wasn't men's way to laugh now. That wasn't your laugh. God gave you a mouth. Amen? Use it for good. Use it the way God gave it to you to use. Prophesy. Give people the scriptures. Because that's what that means. Prophesy and say, thus saith the Lord. Amen? Thus saith the Lord, How ye worth the day, woe worth the day, for the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day. It shall be the time of the heathen. And if you want to, just a simple understanding of that is, God's going to cover the, the land with clouds. 
Okay? The sun is going to be blocked. The light of the sun is going to be blocked. And you think about then what that involves and, and the, even the symbolism behind that. The sun is Christ. He is the sun of righteousness that arises. We are the children of the day. All right? So we are lightened by Jesus who is the light of the world. But at some point the clouds are going to come. Okay? And they're going to attempt to block off that light. Okay? So we're going to see what's involved in that. Now look at Zephaniah chapter 1. Zephaniah chapter 1. I'll give you two seconds to turn there. Verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near. How many times did he say it was near? Why? Remember, we double it. The day of the Lord is near. That's Christ comes the first time. It is near. That's Christ comes the second time. Because God sends the word out double. The Lord, has spoke, uh, the Lord speaketh once, yea, twice. Old Testament, New Testament. Uh, and hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath. A day of trouble and distress. Notice that the day of the Lord then initiates God's wrath. All right? Uh, day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess. So are God's people prepared to go through a time of darkness? Think about it. Some of you, probably most of you, already have been through a time of darkness in your life. Have you not? Have you not been through those times where it didn't seem like God was around? Didn't seem like you could find your way through? It was too dark? You know, when it's cloudy outside and cold and everything like that, all we want to do is huddle up, stay in bed, and, and tell the world to leave us alone. Okay, it has to do with depression. Some people get depressed because of circumstances. Some people get depressed because they've kind of turned away from God a little bit and God's just kind of let them go on their own. Some people uh, get depressed for medical reasons. Okay, there's no doubt in my mind. But in, no matter why the darkness, God always likes to be there for his people. Was God just leading Israel through the wilderness during the daytime? No. He gave them a pillar of fire by night so that if he wanted to lead them through the night, he very well could. And they knew to follow the pillar of fire by night. They always had God with them. So be prepared because even though the darkness and the gloominess is coming, God's still going to be there. It's a day of darkness, a gloominess, a day of clouds, and thick darkness. They're related together. Look up the word thick, look up the phrase thick darkness. Pure Bible search software. Okay? Thick darkness, and I almost guarantee you in every place you're going to find clouds associated with it. Okay? It's sort of like looking up strong drink. If you look up strong drink in the Bible, almost without fail, you're going to see the word wine with it, associated with it. So anyway, verse 16, it's a day of trumpet. Now let's think about that for a minute. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. So think about it. Who in here wants to be raptured? Say amen. amen. There can be no rapture without clouds. That's what God said. God said that. When I bring the clouds over, then get ready. Amen? And, and think about the, the practical application of that. Has not God done his greatest works in your life in the darkest days? Amen. Amen. Okay? So, anything that, I, that I'm presenting to you today, we're talking about gloominess and clouds and darkness and bitterness and sorrows. That's the greatest time God likes to work in our lives. Absolutely, without a doubt. So it's a day of the trumpet. So that puts this then in the context of 
1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Uh, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkle of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. It puts it in that context. I think it also puts it in the context of the first angel sounded, the second angel sounded, the third angel sounded, and so forth. I think it's in that context. A day of the trumpet, an alarm against the fenced cities. Can you think of a story in the Bible where there were trumpets and a city that had a great big wall around it? Jericho. There's a type, there's a shadow, there's a, a foretelling of it in picture form for you. They're going to blow seven trumpets on the seventh day. That's the day of the Lord. That's the millennial reign. That's the Sabbath. And Jericho is fallen. Is fallen. It's Babylon. Amen. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men. Remember their children of the night, children of darkness, because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. I just want to say this very quickly and I'm going to move on. Websites all over the internet telling you to get ready for the last days. Telling you to get ready for the tribulation. Telling you to get ready for this and get ready for that. Now we have silver and gold that we'll sell you because when all the currencies crash, you'll need silver and gold. James said, your gold is cankered. You've heaped up treasure for the last days. You're thinking that if you dig the bunker deep enough, pack in enough food, and get bars of silver and gold, that you'll be okay while everybody else is collapsing. And that, look here. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. You cannot buy your way out of God's wrath. It's already been bought for you. Not with silver. and We're not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold. But with the precious blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So forget about your silver and gold saving. It's not going to happen. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. Study fire, study flames in the Bible. Study uh, when Joel's army comes through. A fire, a fire devours before them and behind them a flame destroys. Before them it looks like the Garden of Eden and after they're done it's a waste desolation. All right? So it's a time of fire. Peter was telling us about the trial of our faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. You see how this connects with 1 Peter chapter 1? Though it be tried with fire. Then he says in chapter 4, Beloved, think it not a strange thing concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened. I think a fiery trial is coming. And you know what? I'm not worried about that. Because I know my faith has found a resting place. It's on the rock, the stone that the builders rejected, and this word is precious to me. And if my faith were to be put on trial, my faith is in what this book says. Okay? So I'm not worried about failing that test. Amen? And neither should you if you read it, believe it, Meditate on it. Go through all that list again, all right? For he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Judges chapter 5. Let's look at the symbolism of clouds. What are clouds made of? Yeah, water. Okay? Water. And it's basically real simple. It's water in the form of steam or vapor, all right? And um, water itself in the Bible... It's a symbol of life. There's no life without water. Uh, it's a symbol of the Word of God. So think about that. Jesus washes. And I shared this with the Church of Christ guy yesterday. And I said, well, who baptized you so you can be saved? He said, my minister. 
I said, well, let me tell you who baptized me. Jesus. He washed me with the water by the word. Amen? Amen? Amen. I was saved by the word of God. The water of the word of God. So, Judges 5.4. Lord, when thou wentest out of Seir, when thou marchedest out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped, the clouds also dropped water. So there's your clue right there. There's the Bible stating the fact that clouds are made out of water. Deuteronomy 32, 1. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine. I love this verse. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew. As the small rain upon the tender herb. And as the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish. That's what this is. It's the published name of the Lord. And what's his name? Lord. Jesus. Wonderful. Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Amen. Prince of Peace. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. So, the symbolism of clouds is we know that when the clouds come over, we know that what they carry is what we need. Okay? So, let's say you were grass. Because that's what the Bible says. All flesh is grass. And that grass needs water. That, in fact, it needs two things. Sunlight and water. Sunlight, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Son of Righteousness, rising with healing in His wings. And He is the water, the Word of God. He is the doctrine that you and I need. Churches, along top of turning the lights out in the congregation, they're not teaching doctrine anymore. They don't teach the book of Revelation. They don't teach the Bible doctrines of this. In fact, Rick Warren bragged in, uh, I think it was an interview he did or something like that, he bragged about the fact that when he teaches people doctrine, he teaches them in such a way as that they don't know it's doctrine. And I'm going... Why keep it a secret? What is it that he's ashamed of to teach in his church, if not teaching Bible doctrine? Because many of you have had an experience where you were in a church, and they talked about politics, and they talked about social justice, and they talked about how to have a better life, and how to life coach stuff, stuff that you could learn at the YMCA. But they were never taught doctrine. Never taught the basic ideas of the Word of God. Never taught about how the Bible is perfect. Never taught about the, the, the beauty of the blood in man's salvation. They don't teach things like that anymore. Because those things are God. That's the very thing that the grass needs to grow thereby. Needs that rain. Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. That all needs rain. And that rain is a picture of God's... Where does our doctrine come from? It comes from heaven. Where did our Bible come from? Amen? Amen. So, that's the symbolism of clouds. The Word. I like this. Turn to Exodus 16. I like this. 66 books in your Bible. 66 decorations on the candlestick in the tabernacle. Ex, uh, Genesis has 50 chapters, chapters, chapters. 16 added to 50 is what? You're in the 66th chapter of the Bible. In the 66th chapter of the Bible is where God introduced manna. Isn't that cool? And what is manna? Yeah, it's, it's, the, the word means, what is it? <laughs> Can you imagine a bunch of Jews standing around looking at that going, what is that? I ain't never seen nothing like that in my life. Okay? Well, it was bread that came from where? It came from heaven. And Jesus said, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. I am the bread 
that comes down from heaven. You eat of me, you shall live. So in the 66th chapter of the Bible, you have a picture of the Bible. Okay? In Exodus 16, 10, it came to pass as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel that they looked toward the wilderness. And behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in where? The cloud. So now take this now. What's going to happen when God brings the cloud over the land? What's going to happen? The glory of the Lord is going to appear in that cloud. And the glory of the Lord is Jesus. He is the glory of his Father. Jesus, in John 17, when Jesus prayed that prayer to the Holy Father, Pope Francis. Right? No. He called him Holy Father. And he prays to his Father. And he says, you know, share with me the glory that we had before the world was. Well, that's sweet, isn't it? So right here, 66th chapter of the Bible, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. That is the word in the clouds. Okay? So what I'm setting you up for is this. There's coming a day, and God is going to bring clouds and thick darkness over the land. And it might scare you. It might scare you. Does North Korea scare you? It does. That guy scares me. That guy is a raving lunatic. And he has nu nuclear, I almost said nuclear, like some of you guys did. He has nuclear weapons. Some of you went, what's wrong with nuclear? He's got nuclear weapons, and the man scares me. Because he's able to use them. And anybody able to use nuclear weapons should be sane and have a fear of God. And he doesn't. Could he attack America with nuclear weapons? All he has to do is get one plane in. That's all he has to do. And that, that's scary. Okay, yeah, it only takes one nuclear bomb. Okay, and it's scary. God's going to bring a cloud over the world. And it's going to shut off the sun for a while. Just like at Calvary. Okay, but just remember what that cloud's bringing to you. It's bringing you the word. In Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 27, this is Ezekiel. He gets to see the throne of God. He sees the four living creatures, the, the priests that are carrying the throne, like the Ark of the Covenant. And he says in verse 27, And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, uh, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. So was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of what? The glory of the Lord. That is exactly what Moses and them saw in the wilderness in Exodus 16. They saw the cloud, and they saw the glory of the Lord in that cloud. And here is Ezekiel, and he sees the same thing. He says he sees a bow in that cloud. Don't you love rainbows? Amen? You see a rainbow, and you just got to stop and look, and then we take pictures of it. I like seeing those double rainbows. Because you know what that is to me? God speaketh once, yea, twice. First and second coming. Amen? Amen. I saw it. I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's what John, John in Revelation chapter 4, and he said, I saw one sitting on the throne. Amen. Not someone, like the NIV. Now turn to Genesis 9. Oh, I love this. Genesis 9. Is God ever going to flood the world with water again? 
How do you know? Yeah. You see, that's you believing the history of the Bible so you can believe the prophecy of the Bible. The history of the Bible is God flooded the world with water and God promised that he would never do it again and he set his bow in the cloud as a sign to that and to this day, we don't believe there's a pot of gold at the end of that, do we? No. No. It's not in the Bible. And besides, I looked. Okay? It's not there. Genesis 9, 12. God said, nine is the number for what? Who knows? Fruit bearing. Okay? Fruit bearing. A woman carries the baby for nine months. How old was Sarah when she had her baby? Ninety. How many fruits of the Spirit are there? Nine. That's in the book of Galatians. That's the ninth book of the New Testament. Okay? This Bible's right. In fact, Genesis chapter 9... Look at the first verse, second verse, something like that. What does it say? Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Okay? It's fruit bearing. Um, the phrase Holy Ghost, 90 times in the King James Bible. 90 times. Jesus was the fruit of the womb of Mary conceived by the Holy Ghost. Okay? Uh, Genesis 9, 12. And God said, this is the token. Remember that word token. It's like the word sign or signify or example. Who was it? Uh, Ken. I, I use this app on my iPhone, iPad from Takarda. It's the King James Bible. And he showed me that he's got a Samsung, so it's Android. I don't know if it makes a difference. But he said the word in sample is not in that app in the King James. Huh? They, they replaced it with example. Now, I don't... Some would say, well, does that make a difference? I don't know, but it's not my book to change. So I'm just uncomfortable with anybody changing words that are in the Bible. Okay? Maybe, am I being too picky? I don't know. But it's just... It's just like someone asking me if they can have the deed to my property because they're going to change one number that's in it. So anyway, the word token. This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud. And it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud. And I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And to this day, God has kept his promise. Amen. And we know that it's sure. But the bow, the one that Ezekiel saw, the one that God promised, he said, that is the glory of the Lord. And the rainbow does not have six colors to it. Seven. Makes a difference, does it? What, uh, does anybody know what color is missing out of the gay pride rainbow? Does anybody know? Huh? Indigo? I don't know what that is. Dark purple? Okay. I don't know if there's any significance to that or not. But anyway, the rainbow, I mean, you know what it is. You took science class, right? And the science teacher had a flashlight and a glass triangle prism and shone the light through the prism. And the prism separated the, the different colors because what light travels in waves and there's different frequencies in there. And so each frequency shows up as a particular light, and it just happens to be seven. Just by some evolutionary accident, God's perfect number shows up in light. Amen? Yes, Kevin.
Are they really? Is it seven colors? It better be. Amen. Amen. I don't know who all put that ark there in Kentucky, and I have no idea why they chose Kentucky. Okay? Yeah. But anyway, it's the coolest thing I've ever seen with my eyes. If you ever get a chance to go see it, go see it. And if you feel led to... Um, I won't say that. I was going to say get a spray can and spray out all the scripture verses that are not King James, but that's that's Steve David don't do do that. Okay, uh, but anyway, it it's built to scale. It's built the same as the Ark in the Bible, and it's it's huge, and it's just mind-boggling. And there's a video that they show where they show you know in fast forward them putting it all that together, and you're talking about hundreds of construction workers. Carpenters, iron workers, concrete workers, uh, interior decorator type people, uh, crane operators, bulldozers. And I mean, you've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people building this thing. And in the Bible, you had four. And you think about that, four. Four men, God uses them to save the world. Amen? Amen? I just, I love that stuff. Amen? Yeah, huh? Leave the jokes to me. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 is the 46th chapter of the New Testament. Luke chapter 2 is where the Son of Man is born in Bethlehem. Okay? The Word of God, the DNA, the, the, the incorruptible seed. Luke chapter 2, here you have the Word in the clouds. The Word is Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Bible mentions twice, it goes out of its way to tell you that she wrapped him in swaddling clothes, verse 7. And then in verse 12, the sign. Remember the word sign? This is the token. This is the sign on you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And those swaddling clothes, in Job 38, 8 and 9, when I made the garment thereof, the cloud, the garment thereof, in thick darkness, a swaddling band for it. He's talking about the earth. And he swaddled the earth with clouds and thick darkness. So when Mary's wrapping Jesus in swaddling clothes, she is showing typology. She's showing prophecy. She is saying, this is him who is coming in the clouds. So when God brings the cloud, you listen to this now. Because we're all, we're all like high on the word of God this weekend. Amen? Okay, we are just... We're just loving this, and we're just, it just feels like we're in heaven. I mean, we've got the preachers preaching, and we've got the angels singing, and Beethoven, and we've got all this good stuff. We've got good food, amen, and good fellowship, and we're loving one another. And I promise you, some of you are going to go home, and the clouds are going to show up. Okay? Clouds are going to show up, and the devil's going to say, yeah, that you are, you're acting all nice and Christian while you're there with everybody else, but let me get you alone for a while, and let's see what I can do with you. And you just remember, when the clouds move in, just remember who's going to be in the clouds. The Word of God, His doctrine, His Savior, your Lord and King is always going to be in the clouds. Now... Turn to Exodus 19, because here we have a, a foreshadowing of the coming of the Lord in the clouds. And in Exodus 19, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but Exodus 19, the Lord comes down, descends from heaven in the cloud, and in Exodus 20, he brings his word. Because Exodus 20 is where the Ten Commandments are. His law, his covenant. 
Uh, Exodus 20, 70th chapter of the Bible, 7 times 10. Okay? So just keep all of this in your heart for when the clouds show up. When the clouds show up in your marriage. And it's not all bright, sunshiny, and happy days. When the clouds show up because your kids aren't living right. Boy, that brings doom and gloom to a house very quickly, doesn't it? When clouds show up because you got the layoff notice. And you don't know how you're going to pay your bills. Or the clouds show up because the report came back and you have cancer. Okay? I'm just telling you, whenever the clouds come, just remember what's in it for you. Okay? Exodus 19, 9, The Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And then verse 16, It came to pass on the third day. That's a time prophecy. The seventh day is rendered from Adam to the coming of the Lord. The third day is from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. He's coming at the third day. Destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll rebuild it. Okay? After two days, he shall revive us. On the third day, we shall live again in his sight. That's Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. So the third day time prophecy is all about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so we have, and it came to pass on the third day. When did, um, when did Abraham lift up his eyes and see Mount Moriah far off? After two days on the third day. Okay? And it was, incidentally, it was 2,000 years before Jesus was offered as the sacrifice on that exact same mountain in that same place. God's cool. Amen? It came to pass on the third day in the morning. That means... It's going to happen at the beginning of the millennial reign, not the end. This is not in the evening. This is early in the morning this happens. In the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain. You know, I just remembered something. Uh, I think God's tying something together in my mind. Exodus 19 and then turn to uh, Revelation Let's see if I'm right. Yeah. Revelation chapter 8. Because in Exodus 19, up on the screen, it's on the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud. When you look in Revelation chapter 8, it says, uh, verse 5, And the angel took the censer, and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth, what is Mount Sinai at this time? It's all together on fire. And smoke is rising up like the smoke of a furnace. And cast it into the earth, and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake, and then you have the sounding of the seven trumpets. They're tied together. So go back and read Exodus 19, Exodus 20, the, the covenant that God makes. And tie that in with the sounding of the seven trumpets. Israel needs a new covenant. Amen. And God's got one for them. Amen? Amen? When he brings it to them, he's going to cover the land with a cloud and thick darkness. And there's going to be thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the trumpets are going to sound. And God's going to give Israel their new covenant. That's what all this means. So, anyway, it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, which means it was louder than what loud is. It exceeded loud. You know what I think that word means? I think that word means that that trumpet was not blown by Moses or Joshua or Aaron or anybody of the camp of Israel. I think it was blown by an angel and it's a sound that is not heard on this earth. It is louder than anything can be loud on this earth. I think when the trump of God sounds, it's unmistakable. Amen. 
Can I get you to say amen to that? So, don't believe those stupid YouTube videos where people are hearing trumpet sounds all over the place. You know what I'm talking about? Don't believe that stuff. Don't believe this. Do you know how easy it is to fake videos now? It's, it's easy. It's easier to fake videos than it is to genetically modify seeds. <laughs> Amen. All right, Exodus 24. Look at this. Look at this. Exodus 24, 15. Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord. You see it? When the clouds are there, the glory of the Lord's going to be there. The glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. There's another time prophecy. And the seventh day, there it is. The seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. Remember, the fiery trial is coming. Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him uh, up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. Those days match the days of Noah. When a cloud was over the earth and what was coming out of the cloud? The rain. Okay? There's a match as it was in the days of Noah. Hebrews 12. I like this one. Huh? Yeah, Jesus is in the wilderness. He was the rock. He was the lamb. He was the tabernacle. He was the priest. He was everything. Yeah. Yeah, he was the ark. Amen. Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, remember what I told you about reading a verse in the Bible. See that you walk circumspectly. So when you look at Hebrews 12, 1, and you want to know what wherefore refers to, go back to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. And then we have Rahab the harlot. And we have in verse 32, Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and of the prophets. We have all of, watch this. You know who this is? The dead in Christ. Amen. They're going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them where? We really are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Who say amen to that? Amen. Sin is so easy. So easy to come by. So easy to get into. And it so easily besets us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You know what you do, Dave Bradley? Run forward. Dave Bradley runs races. Okay? When he goes to Italy, he likes to get in that marathon there where they run around the Vatican, and as he's running, he's handing out gospel tracts to people from all over the world. Uh, is your table out here? Did you set a table up or anything? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Slip it in all their, D their CDs. Okay? But anyway, you pray for him so that God, if, if the Lord so wills it, that God will lead him back to Italy to witness to a million Roman Catholics who need the gospel. Amen. He knows about running races, and you never run them backwards. And it doesn't do any good to run it in the opposite direction. Because anything that you've got in your past needs to stay there. Leave it. Just keep going forward, forgetting those things that are behind. Amen? 
First Thessalonians 4, 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, the cloud of witnesses, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So, the cloud represents the Word of God. It represents the doctrine of God. When God brings the cloud over the land, the bow, the glory of the Lord, His Word, His doctrine, is going to be in that cloud. And which, which of us, having had gone, Lindsay is, has gone through a time in her life where she was scared uh, from something medical. And it was bothering her. And she tweeted about it. And I said, Linz, God's got it. We're going to be praying for you. And uh, God will take care of it. Okay? And she's had a cloud come over her and come over her life. Okay? God's always in that cloud. And at the end of that, when the cloud passes and the sunlight comes back out, you look back and you see that God taught you something. God gave his doctrine to you. He made you one more thing of a disciple. You, there's something more that you know now that you didn't know a year ago. And that's how it's going to be throughout the rest of our life. So I know we like to complain when the clouds come. But just remember, at the end of that, you're going to be so much better, so much wiser, so much more beneficial to you, your family, your church, the kingdom of God. So let him do it. Because at the end of everything, when he brings that last big, great, bad cloud, he himself is going to be right there in it for us. Amen? Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this good, good word. Pray your blessings on it, God, and thank you, Lord, for filling us up this afternoon in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take a break, uh, 3 o'clock, and uh, then you guys come back, sing a few more, and we'll finish out the day, all right? Amen.